This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Shapeshift.io, the easiest, fastest, and most secure way to swap your digital assets. Don't run the risk of leaving your funds on a centralized exchange. Visit Shapeshift.io to get started. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, a cryptocurrency podcast that interviews academics, entrepreneurs, and leading personalities of the cryptocurrency and blockchain technology spaces. I'm Meher Roy. And I'm Sunny Agarwal. And today we have with us Evan Shapiro and Isaac Meckler, who are the CEO and CTO of O1 Labs. Um, pleasure to have you guys on the show. Uh, Evan, uh, do you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, um, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, likewise, uh, happy to be here. Uh, uh, yeah, so I'm Evan. I'm the CEO of O1 Labs. So yeah, Izzy and I founded this company uh, last year to kind of take some of um, take some of the recent things coming out of cryptography for um, from zk snarks to improve resource efficiency of blockchains. Um, I guess what's my background? Yeah, so let's see. So yeah, I guess I've been like interested in cryptocurrency for a while now. I remember running some nodes back in the day, like 2010, 2011 in like Bitcoin and random altcoins. Last year though, Izzy and I really started getting into the space and thinking what we could actually do to improve it because we saw a lot of hype and potential for cryptocurrencies, but we like, it felt like the technology wasn't really matching up to that. So yeah, so we started looking into like scaling for cryptocurrencies and we started thinking about Byzantine consensus. And we had a solution that, you know, got cryptocurrencies up to a few thousand transactions per second, but you know, once you've done that, you have a whole other problem on your hands because you just dumped a lot of transactions onto a blockchain. And now you have this huge blockchain everyone kind of has to share and handle somehow. So that's when we started thinking back into Izzy's research and into ZK Snarks and resource efficiency. Cool. And uh, Isaac, uh, do you mind uh, uh, introducing yourself and what was your background? Uh, you, you were doing a PhD in cryptography and how did that lead you into getting involved with the blockchain space? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, I'm Isaac. You know, some of my friends call me Izzy. I guess Evan does. Um, uh, right. So so I had uh, I I was uh, until January of this year doing my PhD at Berkeley, um, studying cryptography, and I, I was doing kind of theoretical um, multi-party computation stuff. Um, but uh, I had taken uh, a class with uh, Alessandro Chiesa, who was one of kind of the pioneer, really a pioneer of uh, making snarks practical. Um, and uh, Evan and I, as Evan mentioned, had been, have been discussing cri- cryptocurrency scalability and um, uh, the idea of using uh, snarks to, to basically um, compress the blockchain um, seemed like a really clear uh, and, and powerful application. And so uh, we started thinking about this and um, ultimately kind of the, the project was getting so exciting that I decided to take a leave of absence from my PhD to work on it full time. So Alessandro Chiesa, of course, is uh, is one of the authors of, I guess, like the, uh, the Snarks for C paper and the and, and the Zcash paper both. Right. So it's like it's like many, many of the, our viewers would have heard of Eli Ben Sasson who is a professor at uh, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, but then Alessandro Chiesa has always been one of his co-authors in all of these groundbreaking snark papers. So Izzy, you've also worked at uh, Jane Street uh, as, an, as an intern, and Jane Street is known for the usage of OCaml and functional programming in its, uh, in its quantitative trading systems. And I see that you're also using functional programming quite a lot in... Um, in 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 o in Owen Labs, so like, could you give us a sense of sort of your background with functional programming and what you see as its advantages that led you to use this paradigm in in your work? Yeah, sure. So uh, I worked, as you mentioned, uh, at Chain Street as an undergrad, as an intern, and also after graduating full time. Um, and uh, you know, I, I worked at Chain Street because I was interested in functional programming. I I had always been kind of a functional programming person. I guess as an undergrad, um, I first got into it, um, and uh, I would say I would say you know well before working at Jane Street, I, I mostly programmed in Haskell, um, and I guess Elm. I did some work uh, on the Elm compiler. Once working, once I worked at Jane Street, I was sort of fully converted to the OCaml, uh, the OCaml way of doing things. And I think our reasons for working with OCaml are very similar to um, 
Jane Street. So uh, there's this idea that, well, software should be correct, especially when a lot of when a lot uh, uh, when a lot is on the line, be that uh, money or people's time or safety or, or anything like that. And um, I think one of the best tools that we have for writing um, correct software um, are statically typed functional programming languages. Well, really languages with good static type systems, but it happens to be the case that most of those are functional programming languages. Um, and I think, I think you know, if you're thinking of starting a, a, a new project where correctness matters, um, kind of the natural sort of choices are maybe something like uh, Haskell or OCaml or maybe Rust. Um, those all have sort of different trade-offs. You know, Rust is a bit low level um, uh, and is, is a good choice for cases where, where things are really performance sensitive. Um, but otherwise, you know, Haskell and OCaml are a bit higher level, a bit uh, easier to sort of work with quickly. Um, and uh, as for why OCaml, you know, one Haskell, um, uh, I think people who are familiar with OCaml, would, you know, these arguments will sound very boring to them because they've probably heard them a thousand times. And I think they're well internalized by every OCaml programmer. But OCaml has an amazing module system, which is like a, a great tool for uh, making making uh, structuring, organizing code, and, and making uh, working with a large code base and with a lot of people a lot easier. Um, uh, it, OCaml is also strict, which makes performance uh, easier to reason about. Those are, I, I think, the main things that sort of make it, in some ways, a more practical choice than Haskell for large projects, at least in my opinion. I see. Awesome. Cool. Um, and yeah, so you know, you guys did mention it a little bit uh, in your introductions about like you guys saw like some of the scalability problems in the blockchain space and wanted to help solve them. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more though about the genesis story of O1 Labs? Like, you know, how did the two of you meet and like what's the vision here? Um, what are some of the problems you're working on? Like your main product sort of, I know about Coda and Snarky, is there anything else you guys are working on? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I guess for like the origin of the company, so Izzy and I knew each other from high school. Uh, we both grew up in the same town and went to the same high school together. You know, I was living out in San Francisco after college and Izzy came out here for his PhD and we just, you know, started hacking on projects together, uh, sort of when we had free time. Um, I think I mentioned before the whole thing, we tried Byzantine consensus, which led into resource efficiency issues, which led into ZK snarks, um, I guess that's kind of how it all got started. And then we decided to really, you know, dive into the idea and make a company out of it and really build it. Yeah, so so this is this really cool idea of, like, uh, it, it's sort of hard to communicate this this, this sort of vision, but uh, the idea is that you have a bunch of a bunch of programs um, which are all all proving things about their behavior to each other. And, and the net effect is that uh, you can have sort of mutually distressing programs um, which are able to sort of verify that uh, the programs that they're interacting with are actually behaving correctly um, without having to sort of redo the computations that uh, those other people are doing. You know, to give, to give a simple example, you, you could imagine, uh, well, okay, so right now, you know, when you log on to Facebook.com, okay, or let's say to any website, let's just say any website, you get served some ads. You know really nothing about how those ads are generated or you know, what kind of information is, is going into those ads that, that are being shown to you. But um, uh, it, it would be nice, for example, if when you were served an ad, you somehow got some kind of guarantee that that ad was generated with, without using any of your personal data. So without using um, your socioeconomic status or your, your race or your gender or anything that you, you might not want advertisers to, to use when kind of targeting things toward you. Um, and the primitive of a verifiable computation makes that possible. It makes it possible to send someone a piece of data and then a proof sort of explaining some computational fact about that data. For example, this was generated without using any of your personal information. And so I think this was kind of like the idea, this idea to me was very compelling, um, especially, you know, existing as, as we do in kind of a world where we interact with computer systems all the time that we, we kind of have no oversight over or any any, they're very opaque to us, I guess would be a way to say it. Um, and, and the primitive of verifiable computation makes it possible for, uh, to sort of rebalance the power asymmetry that exists between users and the programs that they interact with um, and make it possible for, for users to get some kinds of guarantees about the 
until now, relatively opaque programs that they're interacting with. Right. And so, yeah, so, you know, this is actually a use case of like Z Z ZK snarks that like, you know, most people think of them as primarily a privacy uh, solution. Uh, but you guys are thinking of them more from the scalability aspect. Um, and then what's interesting is then you guys take it a step further and you say, yes, snarks are great for compressing proofs, but there is still uh, inherent limitations on the size of computation that can be proven using a single snark. So you guys jump into like this whole concept of recursive snarks. So uh, could one of you like tell us a little bit about how you make this made this jump into uh, exploring recursive snarks? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, I guess you know first of all, just so credit where credit is due. There's a very long line of works, maybe going back. I'm not sure really how far it goes back, but I know at least to this paper, uh, Valiant in 2008, and then um, papers of uh, uh, Bitansky, Chiesa, and then there's this paper, BCTV, you know, uh, ben, Ali Ben Sassoon, um, Alessandro Chiesa, uh, Iran Tromer, Medar Svirta, um, 2014, working on this idea of recursive composition for uh, sort of scalable snarks. Um, but uh, as far as uh, how it kind of fits into the, to the cryptocurrency space, there. We mentioned, or we just talked about kind of this idea of using snarks to, to sort of prove correct execution of computations to other people. Um, but I think somehow the interesting idea of, of behind cryptocurrency, or one part of what makes cryptocurrency or sort of crypto distributed computing systems uh, interesting, is this idea that programs don't really exist in isolation. They interact with each other, and they have some kind of shared state, and they want to communicate with each other. And that's kind of the functionality that a cryptocurrency system provides you, in addition to some notion, I guess, of money. Um, and so if you're existing in a, uh, a world where there's this kind of evolving state that programs are, are working on and, and all kind of working together on, naively, the, the, the way that existing cryptocurrencies work, the way that you sort of uh, prove to someone that the current state is what it is, is you show them the entire history of that state um, and the entire history of all the computation um, that went into that state. Um, but what the recursive composition construction gives you is a way to sort of bottle the whole state up in, into, into one little proof um, so that, that each computation can kind of carry the whole state with it as it extends the history. That kind of makes sense? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I actually uh, was first introduced to um, recursive snarks uh, at the IC3 uh, bootcamp last summer. Uh, I was I was working on sort of like a little hackathon project with um, Ahmed Kospa. He's like the creator of JSNARK. And what we were trying to do was almost like a somewhat limited subset of what you guys are trying to do, where we saw that, look, the Bitcoin uh, blockchain, the headers take a very long time to verify from Genesis, like just doing that many SHA hashes. Can we create a SNARK over the uh, entire like header verification only? And so, you know, I, that was the first time I ever started playing with like lib snarks and stuff. And, uh, you know, uh, we realized that just like making this entire verification won't work. And so we would, uh, Ahmed sort of started researching into like how to do a recursive snark over this. Um, myself being my first time playing with this stuff, I got it to like manage, like verify a chain of like six in a row. And I'm like, I was happy. <laughs> nice. But yeah. So now all this like uh, research and work you guys have done into like exploring the use cases of recursive snarks have sort of gone into what this project now is called Coda Protocol. So uh, maybe one of you could explain to us what uh, is Coda. One question I have is why the name Coda? So, you know, O1 Labs, I understand the idea is like, you know, constant size, right? O1. Uh, what does Coda mean and why this project? Sure. Maybe I can say something about the name, and then Evan can talk more about Coda. So, okay. Well, let me say the first. The first thing is, if you're watching this, I really recommend that you check out uh, our talk at Zcon. If you Google Z Coda Zcon Zero in our name, then you can find it. I just tried. I think it gives a pretty good explanation. Uh, Evan will will say more. But um, in terms of the name, uh, well, you know, we kind of struggled for a long time thinking of, of a name. Um, but Coda, uh, I, I think it was. It's kind of a cute name and. Um, it, it's Italian for tail, I think. I'm not an Italian speaker. Um, and so the idea is that you only sort of have this little tail um, of the whole chain. 
instead of having to have the whole chain itself, you just have this little tail, which sort of has the current state in it and, and all that. Yeah, I mean, we wanted something that was like minimalist and sleek and like sounded kind of cool. And also like, <laughs> you know, there's this idea in music, of course, as you were saying that like uh, the end of like a measure and, you know, in our, so this really gets into what our cryptocurrency is doing. Um, the main thing in Coda is you really only keep around like the most recent state of the world and a full proof of that state, but the proof is very small. Um, like in every other cryptocurrency so far, the way that you prove that the current state of the world is really the current state of the world is by verifying it by downloading everything that's ever happened at, in the cryptocurrency. So in these other cryptocurrencies, everyone is downloading this huge piece of data and verifying it the same way because they have to make sure it's actually correct. In Coda, you just download this tiny little proof that shows that it's correct. What Coda really does is it's the first cryptocurrency that's actually resource efficient. Um, these other cryptocurrencies, uh, you know, um, as you add more and more transactions, everyone else has to download all those transactions. The, I guess, concretely, like, you know, much of these cryptocurrencies are, you know, well over 100 gigabytes um, in size. And to actually use the cryptocurrency, you have to download that huge piece of data. Whereas in Coda, um, that's replaced with just like this tiny little snark that stands in for that whole range of um, transactions. Right. So, so what Coda does is, is uh, instead of having, you know, every, every new per participant in the network run this computation of, uh, of downloading the transactions and verifying themselves, you can sort of uh, use this technique of verifiable computation using snarks um, to provide people with sort of a freeze-dried computation. That's the metaphor that I use at Zcon Zero, and maybe some people found it helpful. You can somehow give them this computation, a, a little sort of freeze-dried version of, of this whole computation that someone already performed of verifying the blockchain, um, and, and they can just check it really quickly themselves without having to rerun it. So let me see, maybe I can uh, put this in like a little bit of an analogy so it helps some of the uh, listeners understand. So could you think of it, let's say we have uh, snarks and we can take any computation and let's say we can, you know, these numbers are a bit like made up right now, but like, let's say I can, for, for analogy purpose, let's say I can verify any snark in one millisecond. But now- It's only 10, but yeah, sure. Sure, <laughs> right. And you know, which is like a small period of time. But now let's say I had a thousand snarks I wanted to verify. That small piece of time actually turned into a large piece of time, which is now 10 seconds. And so the idea now is we can now create a single snark over the verification of those 1,000 snarks. And now we turned that 10 second verification back into 10 milliseconds again. Is that like a right way of thinking about it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, in terms of how the recursive composition construction actually works. But let, I, maybe let me just say kind of like what the kind of high level takeaway is, just for, so it's very clear for the listener. Um, Coda is a new cryptocurrency protocol, which makes it possible for anyone um, to sync with the network, um, get full node level security, while only downloading uh, a few kilobytes of data and uh, doing a, a few milliseconds of computation um, compared to, you know, gigabytes and gigabytes for sort of traditional uh, cryptocurrencies. So you had this analogy of freeze drying computation, right? So I was thinking like Bitcoin also freeze dries some part of uh, the computation. So in, in Bitcoin, you have this thing, which is a, a, the Merkle tree. And um, so you ha let's say you have a particular block, block 3 million, um, as long as you just know the header of the block uh, and you don't know any of the transactions, somebody could prove to you that a particular transaction was part of that block, right? So knowing a small amount of data, you could check that some other transactions furnished by some other person is a part of that block. And like Coda in a sense is an even bigger generalization of it, which is that I as a new user join the Coda network, I get something that I can verify in 10 milliseconds, but that initial verification, that snark verification I do, allows me to be sure that any particular claimed block was part of the blockchain, and then any tr claimed transaction in that block was also part of the blockchain. Um, yeah, I mean, well, okay, so it's, it's maybe a bit different from, 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 from that. So 
the the kind of uh, mechanism that you described, this kind of SPV um, uh, state commitment uh, kind of thing, um, in some sense, essentially what that gives you is uh, it, it lets you uh, sort of delegate trust over what the current state of the world is um, to miners. So if you're an end user, you can say, oh, uh, you know, I just want to know that my transaction was in. I just get, get this header or whatever. And the miner tells me such and such transaction was included. Um, so you, you don't actually, you don't sort of fully know. You, you, that's sort of a sound thing to do if you trust the miners, but uh, you don't actually know that that transaction was valid, you know, that, that, that the sender actually had that money or anything like that. Um, you just know, know that the miner sort of included that in, claimed to include that in, in this block. The reason why that's dangerous is because you're trusting that at no point in time will there be an attack being run on, like, the chain. Because if there ever is, you're just kind of blindly trusting whoever the current miner is, and that could be a miner that's attacking the network. Well, you're, tr you're not trusting the specific miner, you're trusting the entire group of miners, right? Because, you know, you're, you're saying that not the mi other miners are not going to build on that. Unless you're in a situation where the chain is being attacked, which, I, which is kind of what I've been talking about. Speaking of the, uh, maybe this is a little bit of a tangent, but uh, in your Zcon vi uh, video, I, I remember you talked about how you, you know, have a one, you do the snark for bringing yourself up to the current state. And then uh, the full node will also transmit you a Merkle proof uh, give, showing you your account balance. A question I have is why is that Merkle proof, uh, you know, that in the way that you put in the Zcon video it made it sound like the Merkle proof is like, you know, a magnitude bigger than the snark proof up to now. Why not also create the Merkle proof using a snark as well? I, I haven't thought through if there's a, a, any way to do that, but uh, le let me put it like this. Um, Creating snarks is, uh, it's not so expensive, but it's not the cheapest thing in the world. Um, you, you'd rather sort of do all of your snarking in, in a reusable way. So, uh, you know, in Coda, there's this one snark which sort of, which sort of certifies the entire uh, state by certifying the, the Merkle root. Um, and what that means is that when you want to prove things to people about particular parts of the state, you don't actually have to create a new snark, you just have to sort of show that that part of the state is part of that Merkle root. So it's really about um, avoiding having to sort of make a custom snark every time someone wants to uh, know about their own account. You can just send them uh, a Merkle proof. You know, it, it is an order of magnitude bigger, but uh, it's, it's a, it's, the magnitudes are involved are, are still rather small, so um, the, uh, you're only downloading a few kilobytes at the end of the day. So essentially the future is that if, if I want... So today, when I want to do a blockchain node, uh, what do I need to do? I need to connect to the network and I need to download all of the blocks one by one. Uh, and I, I know the I, I know the Genesis block from someplace else, right? And right. knowing the Genesis block, I download all of the blocks one by one. And then I need to verify all of the accounting. And once I've caught up to the to the main chain, I am what is a full <laughs> full node. And I have the highest security as a full node because I have done all of the accounting check and I know what the final, uh, the final state of the blockchain is. Now in this Coda world, what would happen is that if I want to be a full node, uh, I could have something much shorter. So I connect to one of the nodes in the network. I First of all, I get this proof. The proof gives me a snapshot of the current state, like a hash of the current state of some kind. And it also assures me that this is exactly the hash of the current state and it is backed up by this much proof of work or this much proof of state. Exactly. And then I can, I can do this verification in 10 milliseconds and then I can, I can look up my account balance. Uh, I, I can have somebody else look up my account balance and if when they reply to me, I won't be fooled by their reply. Right? Their reply has to be, will, will always be genuine. From 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 my from my perspective, so essentially, like the, the the main advantage of a system like that is when I am a resource constrained device, like I'm a mobile phone or I'm a I'm a Raspberry Pi, it makes or it, even or even or frankly even you know a laptop or desktop computer that doesn't want to store many gigabytes. True. So so it's it's like Coda. The system is uh, is making like the integrity of the blockchain higher for any of these devices that are either power constraint or are just lazy. 
that they don't want to download all all of that data and verify uh verify the verify the blockchain from start to finish like just a sense of why this is an important problem like as a user i'm used to just checking my balance on ether scan and most of the users are just fine trusting ether scan for it or uh, blockchain.info for it um why did you focus on this particular aspect in developing a cryptocurrency mechanisms like just checking ether scan or 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 something like that are m- maybe historically uh, have been sort of sort of okay uh for it, it seems um but i i think from uh what what we're kind of seeing now is we're moving we're moving into a, a new world where all of these sort of attacks that maybe once we thought of as being theoretical or, or something like that are, are 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 really not when there's a lot of money on the line. Um, somehow these systems can only be as valuable as, as like the, the best mechanisms uh, for attacking them. Um, and uh, I'm referring, I guess, or alluding right now to kind of the recent attacks on all these proof of si- proof of work um, cryptocurrencies, um, which which sort of people had. Thought about it theoretically and sort of knew were theoretically possible, but it took it took a little while for uh, for someone to actually do it. Um, and that's the same, essentially the same thinking with trying to provide people with sort of a full cryptocurrency level of security um, for I- interacting with the blockchain. Is basically as we move into a world where where these kinds of attacks become sort of realistic, we we want to be able to have mitigation against them. Some of the, uh, but uh, a lot of the attacks, the latest attacks, right, in the proof of work blockchains were traditionally, uh, uh, you know, on Verge and stuff, were like double spend attacks. Uh, does Coda help solve that problem, or is it more? It really only solves the problem of like, you know, invalid blocks, but not double spent blocks, right? Well, well, actually, actually, the kinds of attacks that you can run uh, against sort of SPV nodes are are even worse than double spends. So um, you can actually just like. You know, make money out of nothing. Um, uh, if you're if you're doing some kind of state commitment or some kind of you know tr- commitment to transactions or whatever, you can just stick whatever you can change the state however you like, change put whatever transactions you like in there. Um, and SPV type nodes aren't aren't actually checking anything, so you can lie basically in arbitrary ways about about what the state is. Yeah. Maybe I should also the other advantage I think with um, this style of system is that. You know, if we want cryptocurrencies to be running for end users, they're going to have to be as part of other applications, as part of websites, you know. And that's not going to happen if your app asks you to download, you know, 200 gigabytes before you can start using it. It's going to happen if that seems like, if downloading the cryptocurrency to that app is lightweight and easy and quick to do. Um, So I think that's another advantage of these really lightweight synchronizations. Yeah, I, I should say also one thing that, that occurs to me is I, I I think it's sort of a key thing for for maintaining decentralization, especially as throughput increases. Um, you want it to be very quick and easy to to kind of get new processors, traditionally you know what people would call miners or stakers, um, uh, onboarded to the system. And uh, because uh, because existing cryptocurrency verification is sort of anti-scalable in in the sense that it gets harder as it gets used more. Um, the actual onboarding process for for sort of a a, a full node or, or a minor processor kind of gets worse with, with time because that node has to redo all of the computation that ever happened. Um, so, for example, you know, syncing a, sort of syncing from Genesis in, in Ethereum takes uh, I think on the order of a few weeks. I, I, th- that's what someone mentioned to me once. I actually haven't tried it myself. It's kind of a, a silly thing to to do to sort of say. You know, oh, it's been five years. Uh, well, we did all this computation. You want to start doing computation now? Uh, you should start from five years ago, and you know, we'll see you in five years. Um, we can talk then. So, this episode is brought to you by Shapeshift, the world's leading trustless digital asset exchange. Quickly swap between dozens of leading cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, Ether, Zcash, Gnosis, Monero, Golem, Augur, and so many more. When you go to shapeshift.io, you simply select your currency pair, give them your receiving address, send the coins, and boom. Shapeshift is not your traditional cryptocurrency exchange. You don't need to create an account. You don't need to give them your personal information, and they don't hold your coins, so you are never at risk from a hacker or other malicious actor. 
Shapeshift has competitive rates and is even integrated in some of your favorite wallet apps like Jax. So you can swap your digital assets directly within your wallet just as easily as putting on your slippers. Whenever you see that good looking fox, you know that's where Shapeshift is. So to get started, visit shapeshift.io and start trading. And we'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter. So of course, like what's really interesting about Coda is um, it uses some of the same technologies that other projects use. Uh, and it's also attacking the problem of scalability that other projects want to solve. But it's both using the technology and attacking the problem in subtly different ways, right? So for example, if you think of scalability, generally when you look at scan across all of the scalability projects in this space, uh, you will find them narrowly focusing on the problem of increasing number of transactions per second that, that they are doing. Uh, that the blockchain is able to process. Whereas Coda is focused on how to get devices onboarded quickly into the network and trustlessly onto, on, onto the network, right? So one of, the, one of my questions is, uh, does the problem of increasing throughput through the blockchain in, th in transactions per second become easier once you solve the problem of onboarding? Are these two problems related in any way? And of course, my second question would be, uh, when, I, when I look at Coda, you are using the technology of zero knowledge proofs in order, in order to increase, um, in order to attack some of the challenges of scalability. Whereas Zcash is using that same technology in order to attack the problems of, of, of privacy. It would be interesting to compare and contrast how these two approaches differ. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're super, super related. Like, um, I, I think increasing the throughput of these systems is something that, you know, can be done. You can do things like increasing the block size, using alternative consensus, like Byzantine consensus, or, you know, a, a bunch of methods. Um, but re really, the question is, what do you do once you've dealt with that? What do you do once the block size is huge and you're adding a bunch of stuff to the blockchain? Um, so I think focusing on that first, and then we can just do things like making the block size, like, you know, 10 times as big, and then you get 10 times the throughput without any of the added costs of making the block size bigger. So yeah, we're thinking this also helps us solve the scalability issue. I guess I'd say like a lot of people for some, you know, think about scalability, they just think about in increasing throughput. And that's, that's really just changing the consensus mechanism somehow to achieve consensus on more data faster. Um, but uh, as Evan was saying, you know, once you increase the throughput, the, this question arises of like, okay, great, uh, you've increased the the the, uh, the speed at which we can come to consensus about things. But you, somehow, uh, where do you put that data once you're sort of accumulating that that data faster and faster, right? It's like, okay, we had this problem that that the blockchain kept getting bigger and bigger. Now we have the same problem, but actually, it's a, it's a thousand times worse because uh, the the consensus is happening a thousand times faster. So. Um, uh, I think increasing the throughput to me sounds when you don't have a mechanism in place for making it possible for uh, the typical person who doesn't have, you know, whatever gigabit in ether, internet and uh, terabytes and terabytes of hard drive space to spare. Um, uh, it, it doesn't seem like the best idea in the world to, to do that to me. So I, I think having a, a kind of solution in place for making it possible to, for people to actually still have oversight over this now, you know, uh, worrying turbine of, of transaction speed uh, uh, is sort of necessary. So we talked a lot about like, you know, using it to over uh, minimize the requirements on storage for like syncing and stuff. Uh, what about for like active nodes, like who are like, who are, you know, caught up with the network and they're, you know, they're keeping up with blocks. And let's say now we have like, you know, I've heard crazy things like, oh, gigabyte blocks and whatnot, right? Um, you know, obviously miners still have to like propagate those with each other. But like, what about to propagating it to other full nodes? Could, can we, essentially my question is, can we also use the same stuff to reduce bandwidth overhead? Because to me, I personally feel that like, you know, there's three main constraints, storage, bandwidth, and computational power. And from my experiences, bandwidth tends to be the most restrictive of the three. Definitely, like um, I, I, I for for these like nodes that are running consensus and keeping track of the entire ledger, yeah, I think they do have to see the whole block, which limits you to a few thousand transactions per second for like a few megabytes per second internet connection. 
But I, I think most nodes don't need to see like every single part of the ledger. Most nodes only need to see like you know a few paths from the Merkle root like relating to what they're doing. So yeah, that does you don't very need very minimal bandwidth to like transfer that over. Yeah, and you could imagine also nodes who are sort of in in, in an intermediate position between these two kinds of users, who uh, for whatever reason are interested in holding the whole state, but uh, maybe don't need to know how the state changes at every block, but maybe at every hundred blocks. So uh, you know every hundred blocks they can just sort of get, get the diff to the state uh, along with the new proof, which, uh, you know, if depending on how, how big you make that delay, be it 100 or 1,000, uh, you would be able to see sort of uh, perform network usage improvements over just downloading the entire history. So, uh, is it in your uh, Zcon presentation, uh, you talked about how, like, you know, how you would do this where you have, like, state 0, state 1, state 2, and you wanted to create the snark from state zero to state two. And so you talked about having like the intermediate state one. And so you have a snark from zero to one, a snark from one to two, and then like some proof that one and one is equal. Um, when I'm transmitting this to you, do I have to transmit to you all the intermediate states or is um, a diff of state zero and state two good enough? Like just the beginning and end states. Yeah, all, all you have to give me is the diff. So that's what makes this technique very cool. Um, you, you sort of, you know, zero knowledge away uh, the intermediate state um, and, and the intermediate transitions, and, and you can just sort of send me just the diff and, and, uh, and, and the proof that, that there was a sequence of transitions sort of backing that diff. Cool. Um, another thing uh, when it comes to the scalability, another big uh, use case I've read a lot about for snarks is uh, for sharding, right? With sharding, you do need some sort of fraud-proof mechanism, usually. And like, you know, people, the, the projects like Polkadot and stuff are working, they're using a very almost like TrueBit-like game kind of thing. Uh, but like, you know, sh if you have a snark proving the validity of a shard, uh, you can just provide that snark to the main chain rather than provide like the entire history and need this like challenge game with Fisherman. Um, is this something you guys are looking into as well? Uh, I wouldn't say like looking into like uh, actively just finishing the main protocol as the highest priority, but like, yeah, I mean, I think that's totally one of the benefits of having a succinct blockchain enabled by Snarks. Like, you're able to have these chains that are instantly verifiable, like, and not just because of some like economic game that's being played. It's because it actually is like has a real security proof behind it that it is valid. So yeah, I think that's one of the main benefits. I wonder what kind of consensus algorithm will the cryptocurrency system end up having? Uh, yeah, so I mean, so the succinct blockchains are basically independent from the consensus algorithm. You know, we can swap out whatever we want, proof of work, proof of stake, whatever, and that'll be great. Um, the plan at launch is to basically have a variant of uh, Ouroboros Genesis, which is a proof of stake based system. Any thoughts on like, can you explain why uh, you chose Ouroboros Genesis as opposed to uh, you know, maybe more BFT-based uh, uh, proof-of-stake protocols? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think the main benefit of uh, using proof-of-stake as a base consensus layer is because it gives you really good security guarantees, especially the Ouroboros Genesis paper we're using. Um, this is by the IOHK team behind Cardano, and, uh, you know, it's they have, like, you know, real security proofs, and they have real explanations for, like, you know, why everything they did matters and why they chose it. Um, it just feels very theoretically sound to me in a way that um, I'll, we'll see with other proof of stake protocols. Another question I have now uh, regarding the uh, you know the technology the, the the recursive snarks is what are the uh, limitations here? Like, it, well, you know, is this more of a theoretical uh, hurdles we have to overcome, or is it mostly now just an implementation problem? Um, yeah, I, I guess I would say you know in terms of the theory that that's something that's that's very sound and you know has been worked out by uh, kind of all, all these papers that, that I mentioned, um, but kind of as always there there's a, a big gap to overcome between theory and and practice. There are some kind of interesting theoretical things that we've been working on, in particular um, thinking about uh, how to how to make these proof systems more efficient, um, both. Uh, both sort of the fundamental cryptographic primitives underlying them, and, and also um, and also in the in how the the, implement, the algorithms for, for implementing them work. But 
Um, uh, yeah, I, I guess I would say a lot of the work has is is really into kind of well, sort of the the practical engineering work of of sort of snark engineering, which is kind of a whole new thing that has to be invented from whole cloth, and then and then figuring out how to sort of make cryptocurrency work in in sort of a constant size uh, situation, which there are a lot of challenges there as well. So. So, I mean, I guess I think that's a great segue into uh, your guys' second primary project almost, um, which is Snarky, uh, which is, you know, sort of making that snark engineering more feasible and possible. Uh, so would you like to explain a little bit of the, the overview of what the Snarky project is? Yeah, sure. So um, Snarky is uh, our OCaml DSL for writing uh, writing sort of verifiable computations or sort of writing as some people talk about it, snark circuits. Um, so this is like, if you have a, a property that you want to certify with a snark, this is a language for doing so. Um, there are a bunch of other really cool projects uh, for doing this kind of thing. There's um, Bellman, uh, there's uh, Zocrates, there's um, JSNARK and XJSNARK, as you mentioned um, earlier. Uh, but the, the basic idea is, uh, the, the main, one of the main tools that we have for sort of working with snarks right now is LibSnark. Um, Lucenark is an amazing piece of work, but uh, I think, as even its creators would admit, is is not uh, is sort of not the best uh, programming tool. Um, so uh, working, sort of writing snarks in Lucenark uh, is is very low level. Um, it's 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 I would say very error prone. Um, there are a lot of sharp sharp edges and and gotchas, um, and uh, as a result, uh, when you're sort of if writing a computation. Uh, of any substantial complexity, like we have in Coda, you know, verifying a blockchain, you really want to have uh, a programming language for, for doing that. It's kind of like if you want to write a complicated program, you want C or OCaml instead of uh, assembly language. Um, so uh, Snarky is kind of uh, a, a way of, of writing your computations at a, at a somewhat higher level um, so that you can have uh, Things like making abstractions and types and uh, making writing the snark a lot easier to reason about um, and actually do. So maybe I should say, like, uh, you know, we wrote, we wrote, we wrote this, this language snarky, which is a, a DSL in OCaml, um, for the purposes of, of working on Coda. So the idea here would be that, let's say I, I have a particular uh, computation, right? Like, so I. I'm 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 taking a bunch of votes and I'm computing who the winner is, and if I'm the programmer, that's uh, and essentially as a programmer, I want to write sort of a program that accepts as data all of the different votes, and it produces a result, but it also produces sort of a proof that there were certain votes that create this particular election result, right? So. Like I, think, I guess the system is if there are 100 voters and each of them have a vote, so they have a statement. And I as a programmer want to write a program that takes all of these statements from these 100 voters and it produces a proof that a particular candidate won the election without revealing the statements of these 100 voters, then I could use snarky for that purpose. Yeah, right. So like any application that you had in mind where you want to use zero knowledge proofs or verifiable computation. Um, uh, I think Snarky is a is a, a good language to use for for writing your application. So any kind of application that uses Snarks, let's say, for example, um, for example, doing something like, you know, often the kinds of places where you want to use zero knowledge proofs are in situations where uh, maybe one party has some secret data and they want to prove to someone else something about that data without revealing that data itself, while sort of maintaining their their privacy over that data. Um, Right. And so, you know, uh, like I said, I, I tried playing with LibSnarks before and, you know, when, when I was with LibSnark, it was more like, you know, we were given these pre-designed, hand-done circuits uh, and we kind of just had to like plug them into each other. It felt more like I was building a circuit than writing a program. And, you know, for me, I used to do a lot of like electrical engineering stuff. So, you know, that was a little bit fun. But I definitely saw, like, okay, how am I going to build an entire, you know, this is why we built CPUs. We wanted general purpose things. And, you know, basically you're, you guys are building a system that makes it a higher level language that can 
uh, allow you to express more complex logic, basically, right? Yeah, that, that's right. It, it's very it's very analogous to the normal situation in computing, which is like uh, we haven't we have some idea in our heads that we want the computer to do, um, but uh, the computer only stands only understands assembly language. So uh, we don't really well. Some of us understand assembly language, but uh, we'd rather write our thoughts down in kind of a, some kind of higher level way that then can be translated into words that the computer can understand. It's very similar with snarks. Snarks only sort of understand arithmetic circuits, um, but we don't understand arithmetic. Well, some of us do again understand arithmetic circuits. Um, so uh, anyway, you you want some kind of higher level language for specifying that. So. One interesting thing, though, that I liked about what your guys' design was for Snarky was, um, you know, similar to when we're building uh, computers, uh, we have most of our computation happening in the CPU, but sometimes we have like specialized uh, things like, you know, maybe for cryptographic operations that are just very expensive and you need to outsource this. And so I noticed you guys kind of do something similar with this concept of helpers. So let's say I wanted to do a SHA-256 in like uh, in Snarky, but you, you guys offer me a way to like outsource this to LibSnark, for example. Um, oh, yeah. Am so I understanding I, that you correct? Might be the, you might be thinking of Tibalt's Zakradi's talk because he, he talks about this. It's, it's actually a very similar uh, construction uh, that, that they use there, but... The idea somehow is um, some okay. So uh, sometimes there are cases where verifying a computation is, is a lot easier than than performing it yourself. So, for example, okay. So in Snarks, let's say you want to you know divide one number by another number. Um, one way of doing that is uh, uh, well, you could use Fermat's little theorem, I guess. And okay, what this is maybe maybe too in the weeds for 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 this show or whatever. But okay, so there is a way of computing. Uh, you know, the in, say the multiplicative inverse of a number x using only multiplication if you're in a finite field. You can do that. You can use Fermat's little theorem, you can do that. Um, but uh, what's a, a lot sort of more efficient is to sort of ask, okay, what is 1 over x? And then check that actually x times this proposed inverse is equal to 1. Um, that's a lot faster than, than sort of doing the, the multiplication that you'd have to do. So um, that's what's kind of cool about SNARKs is you have this sort of programming model where you can sort of as long as you can check something, then you can sort of uh, you can sort of um, uh, use that as as your as your computation. You can sort of non-deterministically get the answer and then just check the answer. There's sort of very natural, I think, um, formalism for describing non-determinism, which is popular uh, in functional programming and programming language theory world, which is these algebraic effect systems. Um, and so Snarky has uh, like an algebraic effect system where you have sort of these requests for some computation to be performed, and then handlers, which are these sort of programs that sit on top and sort of very much like exception handlers, answer requests for data um, uh, for modeling the non-determinism that you sort of inherently have with, this, with the uh, snark uh, backend, I guess. There also is a facility, though, for uh, wrapping libsnark gadgets. So uh, for example, you know, uh, Let's say you want to use SHA-256, and you don't have to re-implement that yourself. You can sort of use the LibSnark gadget for doing that and um, just sort of wrap it. But anyway. Cool. So uh, I'm, I'm curious about where Coda is at currently in, in its development cycle. I, I, I guess um, a lot of the like, uh, core ideas of it are, you know, we're, you know, they're ready to be launched. We, you know, the, theoretically, it's, it's all done. And we've built a prototype of it that actually uses a succinct blockchain. So we have a blockchain running that folds in transactions and stays the same size. Um, you know, we're still doing like some of the work to like kind of make it ready for like, um, you know, everyone to kind of download and use. I guess mainly that's in the proof of stake. Yeah, Izzy, you can go into that uh, if you want. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, I was just gonna say, so, right. So, right, so there's all the kind of uh, work that goes into making a system robust for uh, lots of people using it, uh, and in, in addition, um, switching over to use a proof of stake consensus, consensus mechanism. Whereas the prototype that's implemented right now uses proof of work. And in this testnet, right, or you know, not it's not a public testnet yet, but like, what is the general like computational requirements, like you know, for the nodes that want to be part of the uh, protocol following nodes, like you know, to create the snarks? What are the compute requirements there? 
snarkifying a transaction um, on a CPU, let's say with one thread, uh, takes something on the order of 30 seconds to a minute, um, which uh, sort of sounds sort of terrifying, uh, I guess, but uh, it is kind of not in the in the light of the fact that you can you can do multiple in parallel. So um, if if you you can use this sort of recursive composition up a tree construction, um, so that the sort of total time for compressing, you know, n transactions is logarithmic in n. So uh, for example, if you wanted to do you know a thousand twenty four transactions, that would take proportional to ten uh, sort of steps of recursive composition rather than a thousand twenty four. That said, we're also uh, right now um, exploring uh, more efficient implementations of the snark prover, uh, and we're hopeful that there there will be uh, sub substantial performance improvements over that um, on certain certain hardware. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, are you also hoping to get like performance improvements? Like I know the Zcash team is doing a lot of like with their new sapling curve. It's supposed to add a lot of efficiency stuff. Is that something that you guys are planning on? Like inheriting some of that work as well yeah so we can definitely we definitely can build on some of that work um so for example they have like this really optimized uh implementation of doing peterson hashing um which we're using in coda but uh some of the work that, that they've done is, is sort of sapling specific um or job job specific or bls 381 specific um and because you know uh our sort of crypto setup is a bit different we can't uh, build on all of that Another uh, thing was, you know, I think a lot of people uh, got first introduced to the concept of recursive snarks because of a blog post that Arthur Brightman made like about a year ago, I think last summer on like talking about how they plan on scaling Tezos. And he talks a lot about this recursive snarks. And, you know, as you know, Tezos is also like an OCaml shop. So it seems like you guys are like, you know, very similar in a lot of ways. Is it, Are you guys uh, working with them in any way or... Uh, so uh, we chatted with with uh, Arthur um, and Kathleen a, a little bit, but uh, we're not working together in any way. It's just, a hap I guess, a, in my mind, a happy coincidence that there's two people who are using OCaml. <laughs> Thank you, Evan and Izzy, for, for joining us today and walking us through your project, Coda. It was a very interesting episode indeed. Um, that brings us to the end of the show. Um, so we at Epicenter release episodes uh, every every Tuesday. You can follow us at uh, youtube.com slash Epicenter Bitcoin, Epicenter BTC for our videos. And we also release our episodes on SoundCloud and iTunes. We always love to hear from our listeners and see reviews. So please write us a review and let us know what we do well and what we don't. And we shall catch you again next week. Thank you.